and welcome back to Self-Selecting Podcast, episode 17. 17 episodes in, we're doing it. Uh, Thank you guys for tuning in. As always, if you're coming from Spotify, leave me a review, super helpful. If you are on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. If you're tuning in for the first time, this is your first, you're like, hey, what, what is this? I didn't know you did longer form content. Uh, yes, yes, I do. 16 episodes. Go ahead. Binge them. Binge them. Go through them. Uh, maybe, maybe there's some answers in here. If you're looking for one-on-one coaching, that is something that I offer. You do not have to be a competitor. That is a question I get frequently, all the time, actually. Uh, hey, Corey, do you work with people who don't get on stage? Yes. Majority of the people I work with not getting on stage yet. They do want to be treated like competitors. They want the attention to detail that I would say most competitors are expecting. Uh, my coaching does not change competitor to non-competitor in the, uh, quality, the quality stays the same. Give you a lot, a lot of things that are helpful in the essence of getting more out of the efforts that you're putting in. That can be fat loss. That can be building muscle. That can be like, Hey, listen, I, I think I'm doing everything right. Um, but I'm not where I want to be. Let's talk. Um, link in the show notes. I do not just accept clients blindly. Uh, we need to do a call. We need to do a 15 minute call, free 15 minute call. If you are interested in coaching, the reason being, I want to make sure we're a good fit for one another. Uh, question I get really often is like, how do you actually I had someone like we did a 15 minute call and then they followed up with like several questions past that. They're like, Hey, like, um, what is the kind of client that you like? Da, da, da. And I, it, like, it really, really got me thinking. Cause I'm honestly, I'm not, I, I don't like when people say like, I'm picky with the clients that I take on. I, I only take on like these types of clients and like, they're typically referring to like someone who's achieved X, Y, and Z, like a national competitor or someone who has a lot of promise. Like if, if they compete, um, I, <laughs> I'm not picky in that sense. I'm picky in the sense, uh, not even picky. I'm particular in the sense that I want it to be a good working relationship. Frankly, I need it to be a good working relationship because coaching is my primary uh, endeavor. That is the primary thing I do coaching. And if someone comes to me, um, let's say, and they, they have very different expectations of the coaching experience. And let's say I can tell off the bat, like, Hey, this is it's just, just not, not going to be a good fit. You're not going to be happy. I'm not going to be happy. Let's like, let's not even go through the intake and all that. Like, let me, <laughs> that's the last thing I want to do is like set someone up on a program. We get started week one, week two, when realistically we could have just identified this on the call. We could have just determined that, Hey, what you're looking for, I'm not going to be able to deliver on. And I think that's good. I think that's how it should be. I think that being very clear about what you want from a coach, I think that's important. Um, I think it can be something that a lot of people feel like they're not able to do. They're not able to ask for specific needs. They're not able to determine, determine, or even really communicate like, Hey, I, I want these things. I think you should, I think you should do lots of consultation calls with coaches. I think a lot of coaches nowadays do that. Um, whether it's for you or themselves, I think it's a great idea though. So that's something that I do offer. I also offer one-on-one -on -one consultations. Consultations are not a like contract based service. You're not locked into anything. It's just a matter of what do you need? What can I help you with? Is it lab work? Are you, are you wondering whether or not everything like looks okay? Uh, is it PEDs? Is it the understanding around like, Hey, you're ready to cross that threshold of becoming an enhanced athlete. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm there. I, I feel like I'm there. I want to be there, but I want to make sure I'm not just jumping the gun. I want to make sure frankly, that there's nothing more I can do. Uh, I think that's very wise. I think it's sensible. I think if you're going to use illegal drugs or use drugs without the supervision of a medical professional or whoever, I think it's something you should be very, you should be versed on relative to what you're going to use. You should for sure understand the potential risk. And I think that's something I just did a podcast this morning, muscle bill, what up? That's going to come out, um, probably here, probably here soon, probably in a week or two. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, and we were, we were talking about like, it just informed consent. 
informed consent. That's something um, in nursing we were drilled on. Like that was such a big component of our edu- of our education, like me and my class, my education. Um, nurses aren't actually allowed to obtain informed consent. We are like, it's so important for us to ensure it has been given that the doctor, that the provider, whoever is going to be doing the procedure um, has gone over the risk that the client feels like they, they understand and they consent to that risk. And that's something that in the sport of bodybuilding um, and not bodybuilding, also just the sport of wanting to take drugs, it's important to understand what you're doing. Um, with the way that the bikini division has evolved, which if you're new to me, new to this kind of content, uh, I talk about drugs. I talk about drugs quite a bit on Instagram. I also talk about adherence a lot on Instagram and YouTube, I guess. And when I'm talking about these things, I'm trying to be so, so clear that like, this is for the athletes, um, really primarily in the bikini and wellness division. Yes, the same principles apply to athletes in the other divisions, but really what I want like to be very clear is that if you are willing to take more risk and you're okay with that, perfect. I I'm still, even if you're willing to take more risk, even within these two divisions, bikini wellness, I'm still wanting to be generally conservative. I'm still wanting to inform you of the potential effects, the androgenic effects, the ones that are irreversible. So if you new to this, uh, episode 13, go, go pretty deep into, uh, the side effects, side effects, effects, whatever. Um, and, and really the approach to making that decision kind of, kind of, I feel like I do. Um, it can seem very abstract and, um, if you're not familiar, there's like, I recommended this actually to a, um, a consultation I did this past week. Cause it was a first time competitor. She's getting on stage, um, here in like, I think three, four months. And she's like, she was looking for like a lot of help, but like, um, we went over the, the basics and then she's like, oh yeah, I'm like in a show day stuff and da 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 and like the pea cup and the suit and da the tan. And I'm like, you should really check out Bikini Talk on Reddit. Um, uh, Biki- Reddit, if you're not familiar, it's a forum platform place. Um, and there's, there's a really big community within the bikini space, specifically covering the sport of bodybuilding within bikini. Um, now keep in mind, there are a lot of dummies in there. There's a lot of dummies. There's a lot of people who say things like they're fact and, and they're not fact. There's a lot of, um, I'll say experts. There's a lot of top coaches in there as well. What I'm trying to say, there's a whole spectrum of people, um, members in this subreddit. And I think globally, I think the information can, can be good, but just like approach it approach some of it with a grain of salt and, and try to sift out like the people that are offering, um, let's just say evidence based advice or just, just advice that is non-biased. I guess like all the advice, like really is going to be biased to some extent. Cause a lot of people, like a lot of people are going to speak from a place of anecdote, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think globally like that little subreddit, it does a good job, um, at, at offering some, insight. Um, there's good discussions for the most part. There's some really bad discussions too. Um, and someone was like, I I don't get posted about hardly ever. Honestly. Um, I've looked, I don't give a shit. I like, it's fine. Um, I'm very, very aware though, uh, that I'm fortunate. I I don't get a lot of flack in there, which I, I, I like to think it's because I, I do generally a good job being consistent, but I did see, um, it's a post not too far back, not too far, maybe it was like a month ago. I don't know. Um, someone was like, you know, I feel like Corey's like demonizing PEDs. I feel like she just talks about it with such a negative connotation. And, you know, I, I looked at the comments and like, you know, it was nice. A lot of people, they're like, oh, I think you're a little off base here. I think like, it was nice. I had, I had some good, i just say support. Um, but I, it did, this is like a couple of days ago when I saw it, I did, it, it did sit with me. Like it was something I was like, okay, okay. Let me be clear because, um, really since I've started talking about PEDs, 
sure, maybe maybe there's been a shift in how I've spoken about it. But, and this this was also something I discussed um, on the Transparent podcast um, with Niall this week. I recorded that. That went super well. I'm excited for you to tune into that as well. We talked about like, because his audience is primarily, I would say primarily a younger demographic, largely men. Um, and he was talking about, he's an IFBB pro. We just definitely go check him out. He's got a good podcast. He talks to a lot of individuals, a lot of top like very uh, celebrities, if you will, in the space. Um, and we, we kind of conversed on this is like, okay, when you're talking about these things, there's responsibility in the space to be very clear about what a compound can do. And I think I, I think I take that pretty seriously. Um, certainly, certainly virilization. I go pretty hard in that's my prerogative. Like I, I, I feel like any, any less, I think if you downplay virilization to anything, any really anything less than I have, um, it sends a message because I generally I, I do try to say like, Hey, do whatever the fuck you want to do. I don't care if you don't care about side effects. That's fine. It's not on me to tell you that the side effects, the negative effects, whatever, are too much. It doesn't like, it, it is not my place. You listener, it is not your place to be like, Ooh, this girl, her voice sounds like shit. I mean, I don't even know how we would discover any of the anatomical changes. Like it's way too far, but I would like, I would strongly, I would strongly suggest that like when you, the listener is, um, assessing, you know, okay, has someone incurred side effects? Have they, have they gone too far? I think the lens in which we have to look at that from is relative to what they consider is too far. Generally, most people that I speak to, they want no changes. They want, they only want the anabolism. And that's if we're talking about anabolics, if we're talking about non-androgenic tools. So clenbuterol, uh, thyroid replacement therapy. So T4, T3, metformin, GH, L-carnitine, fuck it, yohimbine. Cool. Like tell them start and we can go down like the chain and like come up with all these non anabolics, but generally like anything that's going to act on the androgen receptor these are ones that like, frankly, I, I think we got to be really careful with even something like SARMs. Like I, I still, I still think the, the tone in which we talk about this and it's really, it's not for the advanced user competitor athlete. This is for this, like comes from a place, at least this is why I do it. I know that there are a lot of people in the space who they hear like, oh, you take, you take PEDs and they assume that this is one in the same of just simply buying a fat burner at a GNC or you know, I guess ordering something online. Um, it's just a little harder to access and you got to know a contact or whatever. And I was very fortunate that when I got into the sport, I had people in my corner, I had people around me who were like, Hey, don't make that jump until one, you you actually need it, but also don't make that jump until you can concede and like just accept that there is a risk associated with using these things. And if you're not okay with it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that decision prematurely. I think when we downplay really the the potential of these drugs, which frankly was the case for a lot of the time that I've been in the sport. So many people, so many people in the, like the realm of like 2016 to really like now, so many people be like, oh, Anavar is like female friendly. It's safe. It's like, it's what everyone takes. So it's okay. If it wasn't okay, everyone wouldn't take it. There are so many logical fallacies that have, you know, just been hounded, um, around drugs that honestly, I, I do think have resulted in individuals using things they shouldn't use. Um, doses they shouldn't use or using them in a way that ultimately like for a length of time 
that is reckless. Now I want to be clear is like, it's not, it's not up to me to say like, this is a, a reckless use or this is an incorrect use. Incorrect implies that there's a right and wrong way. And when we're talking about virilization, when we're talking about making that decision for yourself, that's where it's such a subjective, I would say, measure that you can't put everyone into the same category of risk acceptance. Now, when I got into the sport, there were people using drugs. There were girls using drugs that like, I mean, frankly, I, I, I didn't do enough digging around you know, the people that I, I was near and close to. I just knew they were using something. Um, yeah, I would hear names, but I didn't really have an interest because at the time I was like, I'm not there yet. So like this, this, this isn't a great interest to me. Um, through the community, through friendships I formed, there were people that were like, yeah, like I'm never using this again because I did get side effects early on. I did get, I did incur negative effects. My voice changed. My clit grew like I had terrible acne. Like there were just, there were, there were stories and like I was young, I was naive. So I was like, okay, like I just assumed that's what all drugs did. And that was like inevitable, um, regardless of, of specific compound, regardless of anabolic or non-anabolic. I think since then, since 2015, there's been a lot more people, um, on social media and within the, the space of like bikini, like the bikini division, female side of things who've come out and talked about their use. Some of which are sharing like, Hey, like you need to be informed of the potential here. And I think that's great. There's also been a lot of people who've come out and who've downplayed essentially what can happen. I'll tell you, like, I didn't realize, I didn't know that this was as big of a problem really until I started taking on more clients who were coming to me specifically for PED help. And they were like, Hey, like, you, you seem to share similar values that I do. Um, I want to do this as safe as possible. What is the best method? And we kind of cycle through, okay, like what have they taken previously? What have been the dosages? What have been the durations? What was the indication? What was the reason behind it? And the thing that really struck me as a commonality amongst most people is the indication was very unclear. The indication, like the reason that their coach put them on this was to drive fat loss or, or muscle growth, yet the phase in which these things were used wasn't totally sensible. And to some extent I can get like, I can get behind, you know, if a competitor comes to me and they're like, I'm really insistent, I want to use this drug. Um, and they, they understand the risk. Okay. Like I, I might not think it's totally appropriate, but if they've done everything and like they, they've decided that, okay, like I'm willing to be generally safe with this approach. I'm like, okay, here are the conditions. Here's the way in which I would go about this. And the reason is like even someone, cause I've had these clients where they're, they're very insistent. Like, I don't want to wait. I want to get the most out of what we're doing. And I mean, assuming that we go through that period where it's like, okay, I can see that they are growing and they're actually willing to, you know, be very adherent, very communicative about, um, you know, all aspects of the program. And I can like objectively see, okay, you're on track. Yes. And you have goals that require us to be more aggressive. Okay. Yeah. I might say for me, that wouldn't be a reasonable approach or for a different athlete, that wouldn't be a reason reasonable approach. But ultimately if they're going to do it anyway, and if they're going to do it under the guidance of someone who may not be as safe or who frankly just might not care as much about the overall outcome. then yeah. Okay. You know, that that's a very, it's a very narrow index of individuals I work with. And I think we have to keep, that in mind, um, whenever we listen to different people's cycles and whenever we listen to what people have or haven't used or the reasoning behind it, 
there's a, a lot of bro lore surrounding the use of different compounds and I think they talked about this too in 13, so I'm not going to just beat it to death here again, but like the framework in which you make these decisions comes down to the need. Okay. Well, when we're going through anabolics, I don't think a lot of people are at the point where it is truly necessitated, but if they decide that I would like to use this, if they haven't maxed out their natural potential. If they're at a point, they're like, Hey, like I'm, I'm going to be in and out of the sport, um, within a, within a few years, because that's the, the period I have. And then I'm done. Okay. You know, maybe, maybe we do take a more aggressive approach. That's, that's their prerogative. They're, they're allowed to do that. Like, that's not necessarily my place to tell them like, no, like we're only like, I, I can put the framework in place, but ultimately I am in the business of like helping people make better decisions. And yes, that starts with them being informed, but ultimately it is their decision. So yeah, I mean like realistically, the way the division, even the bikini division, but specific, like also, especially the wellness division, the way that they've evolved, I mean, 2020 to 2022 to 2024, there have been leaps and bounds and we see this reflected in like current competitors physiques. Like we see that even at the highest level, you have athletes that at one point were like considered very dense are now like, no, like we're turning it up a notch. Like we are, <laughs> we're, we're back to growing. And I mean, like, yeah, like the evolution is definitely serving me. It's certainly serving me because trickling down into amateur competitors, national level competitors, um, whether warranted or not, there is an increased belief, so I guess a prevalence of this is now just a part of the sport. And like, whenever I do consultations, I mean, like I'm never, I'm never really like probing, like, tell me who your last coach was, or if they say they worked with someone, um, I'm familiar with, I'm not necessarily like, Ooh, like tell me what they, they ran with you. Usually that information is volunteered. It's almost always disappointing. It's almost always excessive. It's almost always at doses that like there, there isn't a good indication that we should be increasing. So you take with like anabolics. Um, yeah, like I can tell you like two and a half, that's probably where you should start. And, and yeah, it com like it comes from a place of if you can get anything out of two and a half, get that before escalating to five, because you're not going to go to five milligrams. I'm talking about Anavar for listen, whoever's like fucking lost. Like, yo, like just, I have no context. <laughs> Anavar, Anavar, uh, it'd be a different dose for like an injectable. But if we're talking about someone who historically, like they've used five and like, it's very unlikely this person's going to walk it back and use two and a half and be like, Oh, I'm so impressed with my results. Um, for athletes who come to me, who, who have not made that jump, who've never used anything in the past or frankly, who have, who are very like aware, like oh, I used too much. It was like 10, 15 milligrams um, for, for a long period of time. Like, can we just see, can we see if there's any potential with you pulling more out of a lower dose? I mean, obviously sourcing is going to be huge here. If you have someone who is only able to source like 10 milligrams, I, I'm very hesitant to have someone quarter that, but we are in a, a day and age where like, luckily, like with telehealth, with a lot of private businesses, um, becoming a thing, uh, farm grade Anavar is, is less difficult to source than it once was. I still think. I still think being clear on what you're willing to tolerate and being clear on where you're wanting to go with the sport. I mean, like if you're someone who is wanting to be a professional athlete in the sport and you have, let's just say uh, a finite window, like you are not willing to do this endlessly. Okay. Well, we, like if we build out like me, if I build out the timeline and I'm like, okay, so in order to turn pro, you're going to have to do that by this, this date or this season relatively that only gives us this amount of time to grow. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe we are going to be more aggressive than someone who let's say is like, you know what? I just want to see how far I can, I can take my potential before introducing additional compounds. Sweet. 
that needs analysis. Yes, it's based on the division, it's based on your risk tolerance, but the the, the long-term goal, that really is going to determine how aggressive we're going to be. I also have clients who, I mean, they, they don't get on stage. They would like to use drugs and I, it's not, it's not my place to be like, Hey, you can't use them. I would never, never say that unless their adherence like really sucks. And it's not even like, it's like you can, it's just, this is not a good use of it. Like it's just not very sensible. So I guess like parsing through, okay, you have this physique related goal and now you're setting a, a deadline of like, I want to accomplish this by the state. Cool. But I need from an athlete and this kind of goes back to how I opened the podcast is like, what do I need from an athlete? I need an athlete whose actions are going to line up with what they say they want. Because if you just want to put drugs in place, like that part is the easiest thing to do of all the, it's the most convenient part of bodybuilding. It takes no additional work, like actually like putting the drug in, um, managing fatigue, managing recovery, uh, being consistent enough to where we can see whether like the phase that you're in is effective, being focused enough to where like you can see out of phase. You're not constantly like, like ping ponging back and forth between like, I want to cut, I want to grow, I want to cut. Um, I think long-term there's a lot of people who will struggle to admit that, you know, maybe they, maybe they did take risk that now they do regret. And I see this in fellow competitors. I see this in people I work with. I'm fortunate that some people even are, you know, vulnerable enough. They'll open up with me and they'll be like, yeah, like I, I did realize and it's disappointing. Um, as much as I want to continue to take drugs, I know I can't do what I've done up until this point because that part is inevitable. I saw effects occur. I, I incurred those effects by, by proxy of I mean, the decisions I, I made at one point. And you know, like when we really get into the weeds, your health, I mean, like it, your health, it should, should be a priority, but frankly, it's not, it's not going to be for a lot of people. Um, so as you try to navigate these decisions, as you, um, try to determine, you know, okay, like I'm in that gray area of I'm doing almost everything that I can do and I'm going to continue doing that. But I also want the results faster. Like there, there's nothing wrong with communicating that, like just that, like, Hey, I, I have a little bit of a time constraint here because I have other things in life that I want to do. I do want to have kids probably after having kids, I, I'm going to be off stage for maybe a year or two, maybe longer. Maybe I'll never get back on stage. If that's the case. Okay. Okay. I hear you. We just, we have to be really clear that the results of these drugs are very individualized. There's a high discrepancy in how a drug could affect you. And to me, that is worth, um, laying out very clearly for someone whenever they're, you know, they're between, they're looking to me for expertise or guidance is like, Hey, I can tell you most people don't experience a negative effect or an unwanted effect at this dose for this duration. But realistically, I can't promise you that. I can't promise that this won't be too much for you. There's a lot of people who like will stop listening like they'll, they'll see the short on Instagram and like they'll hear about like, okay, Anavar versus Primo. Okay. So she said Primo in the off season. So now I'm just going to do Primo in the off season. Cool. And that's the extent of it. And that's why a lot of the videos that, uh, I've come out with like really the last, last six months, last year have been more informative. I would say just generally like, Hey, do these things. Sure. It, it might be required for your aspirations, but depending on what you're willing to tolerate in terms of risk, that might result in things that you don't want to change. And it's real easy to find a handful of people and be like, well, I think she took stuff and like, for sure, she's super dense and she still sounds like a girl. Yo, you don't know what's like going on physiologically though. And the same applies on the other end. Just because someone has taken a lot of drugs, it doesn't mean that they 
aren't highly resilient, it doesn't mean that they, just because they didn't experience effects like neg- androgenic effects, it doesn't mean that that individual did things necessarily correctly or, or as safely as possible. On the bikini side, like bikini is the lowest barrier to entry from a muscularity standpoint. Like it would be just such a disservice to deny that and to say that like, oh, we, we have to get as muscular and as lean. Like we fucking don't. Like it's just, it's not true. We have to get much more muscular than we had to in 2020. Like the physique I had in 2021, I, I some people have been like, like you're crazy. I, I don't know if that would get a pro card today. Uh, the physique I had in 2021 that I competed as pro with and even 2022, I still think that physique would be very undersized, especially looking at these girls. Like it just pulled up like <laughs> the New York pro, like fucking like stallions. Like the glutes are, are truly, truly insane. Uh, it, and yes, it's a, it's a conditioning thing. It's a muscularity. Sure. But like, and I, I guess like I should preface this too with like, I'm not talking about every pro who gets on stage. We have a lot of bikini shows every year and you're going to see like, if you're a fan of the sport and you're watching these shows take place, you're going to see like really past the first call out. There is a big drop off in like conditioning and there, then there's shows that even the first call out like the conditioning is not there or the muscularity isn't there and like that happens just based on sheer volume of number of athletes competing number of shows per year my perspective though on this is like when i compare my physique um i'm very much looking at the top athletes i'm looking at what's being awarded and i'm, I'm listening to to the feedback and like some of these physiques they're told like oh you need a little bit more muscle and i'm like like really like okay if that's if that's what y'all want and sure like feedback there's high degree of variability in what is said versus what is actually meant that's where you really have to have like someone in your corner who has not only a good eye but can also like discern what is meant like i i've received like inverse feedback from judges at the same show before Uh, You need to be bigger. You don't need to be any bigger. You need to be more conditioned. You're way too conditioned. I've received it. And like, I mean, it's, it's insightful. And I was strong. I like highly recommend if you compete at any level, always seeking that feedback, always like trying, trying to get the feedback, honestly, at the show when they remember you, If, if you're able to fantastic, like get it. Yes. But know that like what is being communicated, depending on the judge that you're talking to, depending on the words that are actually used. And like, I mean, it's usually a conversation. It's usually not just a single, if you're talking to them in person, it's usually not just a single line of like more conditioning by there's discussion around like, okay, it was right around like your glute ham or, you know, your core was just not as tight or yeah. Like you, you just looked a little wispy. You looked a little undersized dig, dig a little bit. And then also be objective too. like, I mean, looking at, you you can compensate and there are girls with very very petite frames very small frames who do incredibly well and it could just be a matter of who showed up that weekend and it doesn't mean that the next weekend if they compete again or if they go to um, a more competitive show per se or a show where judges are you know a little more partial to size or even not even partial to a certain aspect but even they're like hey, we're really trying to crack down on the conditioning. We're really, really trying to, you know, last weekend there were people who were awarded who were kind of like a little, little bit too much. We're trying to rein it back in. That kind of thing does happen. Like judges have discussions around this. So it's important as an athlete, but also as a spectator when you're coming to these conclusions, like bikini is hard to judge and proportions are going to play a really, really big role in it. Overall structure and structure relative to conditioning relative to presentation. Like I can tell you, I've had people outright be like, you know, like from the front, just standing straight on, like your waist is not small, but when you twist, your waist disappears. Uh, like other, other athletes, other coaches have said this and like, they're, they're not wrong. Like I, I, I have a pretty developed core. And if I don't hit my poses, right, like it looks not so small. The idea is, to not have to use your posing to compensate 
in in a manner that ultimately like reduces your chance of doing better objectively like in terms of placing against higher level competitors and this applies like at the pro level this pro- applies at the amateur level ideally you should be in a position like I, th- I think one of the reasons a lot of these top athletes are as successful as they are is because they have the muscularity in order to not have to compensate so hard and and even if if they do i mean like okay maybe structurally they're they're very gifted so any kind of compensation it just appears it it appears as if they're compensating less i think one getting getting a multitude of um experience on stage and really seeing how you stack up against uh, people who are competitive like that's the thing again amateur and pro level you know doing a regional show it is kind of like the wild west like you don't know who's going to show up you could do objectively very well depending on like you could do objectively well at your worst even if like it just just on the basis that people show up that are not in shape vice versa you could do very poorly showing up very conditioned in the case that everyone shows up and they have a much fuller much denser look but i think that's where like you know tying this kind of back to the drug use we don't have like player cards like we don't have like baseball cards where we can there's stats where we can see like okay this person used this at this point during prep they did this in their off season oh and also like asterisk in their off season this was the first time that they hadn't traveled or this was the first time they took a considerable amount of time off this is the first time that they actually went up above five ten pounds of their stage weight we don't have those stats like we really have people's social medias and then like uh, honestly subreddits like bikini talk where people are like lunatics they'll like put like side by side and be like this is how she looked at this show this is how you know and i say that lightly i'm not like not trying to be disparaging it's it's helpful and like i mean it's helpful in some ways because you can see trends of athletes over a course of time you can see the physique development which i think is good if you're trying to learn more about the sport and more about how people are becoming successful within the sport but keep in mind like the drug use we know nothing about that and most most top athletes they're not going to be transparent about that and I, I don't blame them i don't i understand it but it's a little naive to to assume like okay because they don't talk about it we can just assume they're natural i think it's just as much problematic to assume because someone made progress or because someone looked significantly better at one show versus another that they added in x compound or, or, you know, whatever, this non-androgenic PED. Success, like actually on stage, actually winning, um, improving on placement, so much goes into that. And I do think when we're talking about the pro level, like we are splitting hairs because there is an argument at, at some competitions, there's an argument for one person to win over another. And maybe it really is just like a one or two point difference between the top one, two, and three. But ultimately, if you are really trying to compare and contrast and be like, okay, this athlete has done incredibly well thus far, and she made improvements season to season. I think before you jump to like, okay, she probably took this drug. You really have to consider, okay, like, has she, has she been paying her dues? And I don't, that's, I don't say that like to slight anyone, but it's like, have you consistently shown up, got in front of judges, gotten feedback, applied that feedback? That's something that if a judge specifically tells you like, Hey, this is something to work on and you do that that is favorable. That is going to increase the likelihood that the next show that you do better. And it can even apply at the national level. Um, Tate Tate competed last year. Um, We got her in front of several judges and like, I mean, yes, it was pretty consistent judge to judge. Um, And the feedback wasn't surprising, but it is very much about taking, generally taking that feedback trying to apply it while also trying to just enhance the physique as a whole and just become a more competitive athlete, showing up prepared and then letting the cards fall. I mean, like, yes, you have the aspect of actually competing on stage, but so much of that, so much 
about show day and like who you compete against is out of your control. And if everyone on stage, like if it's the same people, which realistically it's not going to be, if everyone, all, if they all made improvements, well now we have, let's just say six, seven different physiques that are all more competitive, including you, know, you in this analogy. I think from the top down, like you can look at what does well and you can try to strike that balance of like muscularity and conditioning. But I, I was of this belief for a long time that like, oh no, it's a drug that I'm missing. The drug itself is the one, like that's like the difference between my physique and like, that's so silly. Like looking back, I'm like, I believed that for so long too. I'm like, oh, like I must be just uninformed and I just, I just must not be using the right thing. Can tell you it's, it's not the case. Like, I mean, I say this a lot, but like the drugs are going to enhance whatever else it is that is already happening. They're going to help you in a fat loss phase. If, if that's what they're intended to do. Sure, cosmetically, you put in an anabolic and a prep and like there is an argument to have it in prep for certain people. It's just the majority of people that I'm exposed to, the majority of people who do use it, there are so many glaring holes in their approach, like in their prep, in the in the pre-prep phase, like in the off season that I'm like, you can put it in. It's just not going to make that much of a difference in terms of overall placing. So like for for the athlete who realistically they they have work to do sure like you can lean into these non-androgenic peds in your in your fat loss phase and that's going to help uh it's going to help in a lot of ways it's going to help you get to your final destination which is stage um it's going to take off some of the load that's going to come from just simply needing to be in such an extensive deficit which i i'm a big fan of like i'm a big fan of and i guess that's like when I sat down to record, I didn't know what the fuck I was going to talk about. And I just I was like, oh, yeah, that thing in bikini talk, that would be a good one. Okay, people might like that. Um, because, it, again, it's the application of these drugs. And, like, generally, like, I, guys, I'm very clear. I take drugs. Not natural. I guess where the distinction, in my mind, at least for myself, which is really, like, ultimately, that's the only call I get to make is, like, what's best? What's best for me? What am I comfortable with? It would be insane to try to get on stage without like for me at this point it, it would be very reckless to try to get on stage uh get on stage without the use of enhancements but with respect to that there's certainly a more intelligent way to go about using them and there's a less intelligent way and then there's the gray area in between that's like hey are you close to making a run at the olympia are you, are you like actually just a point away? And this actually, you know, this is something I want to mention. Cause like my last prep, you know, working with John, um, I did the night of champions. I was way too lean and I'm not disappointed with that showing because really that was a, like I was turning a page. Like I was, I was essentially self-coaching. Like John was my second eye, but frankly, it was a lot of it myself. I was doing it differently, like from a drug perspective. When I was with Shane, yeah, we used drugs. We used different drugs. So going about it a more intelligent way, I'm like, okay, am I satisfied with my ability to get conditioned? Yes. Did the fat loss agents work? Yes. Uh, having TRT in place, did it help um, from an anti-catabolic standpoint? Yes. Did I expose myself, this going into Night of Champions, did I expose myself unnecessarily to risk of, uh, Virilization, no. So for me, getting on stage, even like, and it's John Jewett, of course, like people are like, who, who, who is telling you this is bikini? I'm like, it's John Jewett, like, and me too. Like me, me equally like, yeah, this is good, right? It's, it's not something I'm like, it's not something I'm sour about. I'm like, it got really fucking lean. And like, it was cool. Like I, I do like a, a leaner look. Um, that's not conducive with a better placing on stage so when i placed i got seventh at night of champions i was like it was okay but i was also like yeah still glutes are glutes are not there they're they're just not as big and like okay cool but our debrief around this because i had another show planned um fuck what was it um at the miami muscle that was the next one i was gonna do and and then we agreed we're like okay like I wasn't third. 
I wasn't even fifth. Like I wasn't in that realm of discussion. Like I was, I, no, I was second call outs for sure. Um, good, very good at the pro level. I'm very happy. Like there's no like self deprecate, like it's a very good placing, but John and I, we were very like clear about, okay, I do the Miami muscle depending on how I do. Like it probably is time to shut down the season just because like the, like extending that. And I guess I should back up like after night of champions, we agreed. We're like, okay, it does make sense to put in a little bit of Anavar because there is a fullness that I'm lacking that will not be achieved by just simply filling out. We'll bring a fuller look. We'll up food. Um, we'll do just a very like predictable, like filling out process. I ended up not doing the Miami muscle because I think like literally the day of like my flight, my flight was the flight itself was canceled. I forget if there was like storms in LA or storms in Miami, but I know a lot of people, they, there were people who were like redirected. And when I looked at flights, the only ones that were available, they had like layovers in like Texas and Denver, but it was like, it was one, it was at a ridiculous time. Like it would put me getting in like the day before the show. Um, so like, I remember the, the logic of it. Like I, you know, talked to Patrick about it, talked to John. I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to sacrifice everything I just did. Also spend a shit ton of money trying to get on a new flight. Uh, when I fucking, like when I had my flight, I'm not going to sacrifice like all the work I've done to have a bad showing on account of travel. Like that's real. that's not how I've done everything so predictable at this point that I'm not going to have a showing that isn't representative of my best. Um, I know there's a girl I was supposed to compete with, I think Lizzie, who we were like messaging and she's like, yep, got like a layover. I feel like it was like Dallas or somewhere. And she ended up like having to stay the night there. My, it's, it, was, it was a long time ago. Um, her and her husband may have drove, but it was like, it was so many additional hurdles to go through. And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. So we, <clears throat> the following weekend was the mile high. I'm like, easy. Okay. That's one more week. Um, another week I can try to drop off some fatigue, but also at that time it was pretty run down. I was like, I want to get on stage one more time, but like, I'm also, I'm also pretty done. Like I'm not going to see out this season again under the guys that like we put Anavar in place. It did help my overall look. I looked really fucking full. Um, we pushed food up, but even then like the fullness that I achieved, like it was not sufficient to get a top placing and granted the next the next show mile high i think i got eighth i'm pretty sure it was eighth the girls above me like all of them all of them were really competitive and that was the thing like i wasn't i wasn't close it wasn't one of those things we could be okay well we'll just leave anavar in we'll try to grow a little bit and i remember i talked to john like on on the way to the airport um yeah, I think I flew home that night. I talked to John and he's like, yeah, like I'm, I'm glad we're on the same page. It's like we could keep the anabolic in place and try to manipulate some things, but like your threshold for improvement where we're pretty much at the upper end of that increasing anabar isn't going to help. Like taking six weeks off, like you're not going to, you're not going to grow. And also you're not in a position really to add like the tissue that you need. Doesn't make a lot of sense. And it was like, that kindness and honesty from him, it meant a lot to me because like it was in his best interest to be like, yeah, continue, keep going. As it is most like coaches, most coaches, like I'm not saying every coach, there are a lot of shitty coaches out there though. You have to consider that like the hard thing for a coach to do is to tell you that like, no, nah, it's a wrap. Like we, we can't really squeeze out anything more here at this time. And like from a business perspective, like it, it actually, okay, now for them to be in the same position again, they have to go through probably another prep with you or with someone else. And we, I was talking about this this morning uh, with Muscle Bill. I was like, yeah, like that kindness, that selflessness, that like care from someone. I really, I really valued that. And that's honestly, it's a big reason that like as I coach, I'm like, okay, like someone wants to get on stage. Cool. Before the placing, like I'm not, I'm not trying to be before the placing. It comes down to like, what is best for this individual? If this was me, 
what kind of considerations would I want someone to make? How, how do I operate in a way that really considers what's best for them? Not just now, not just like, cause some people are like, Hey, I want to do this show. It's like one or two weeks away. Can we do it? Or it's like four weeks away. It actually, no, the big one, the big one that's like hard to explain, um, that I get pretty often is with prep clients. They'll do a show and they'll be like, okay, what about a national show here in three months? I'm like, it, it, like they just did a national show and they're like, okay, what about this one in, in three months? I'm like, you weren't close. Like with Tate, fuck, like that was long. That was like eight weeks. And like, I mean, she fucking tolerated that. Like, I mean, we brought her out of a deficit, tried to build a little bit, but like it was, it was a lot to ask. She was so close, so close to her pro card at her first um, national show that we did together. She made big improvements. Then we went to the one after that and was like, despite big improvements, despite it being her best look, it was still like, it's just the way the cards fall sometimes. And I think in this sport, it's very easy to feel as if you only have this one shot and like, you've worked so hard. Let's just push a little bit more. I get it because I, I have that same urge I have that same tendency to be like come on like what's one more but like even just with my athlete um Talia like we we're at that final week like she's gonna compete next weekend in Korea she um looks incredible but like we're both very clear like even if there are more shows after this it's not in her best interest it's not going to serve her like she's she's done so well this season and she's made big improvements from last season and we're doing things with her health and her her longevity in the sport because she's young I'm like we're doing things in a very respectable way and that's really like my mission is like if we had to lay out the whole prep if we had to, like, if I had to demonstrate and like present this to someone else and justify like my decision making, uh, reasons for including different enhancements in and out of prep, would any part of me be like, yeah, I, I know? Would any part of me feel bad or be like, yeah, that was like a little aggressive? I would rather, like, looking back at my career, like when I started and like the shows I've done, I've been so fortunate that I've had so many people in my corner. I mean, like even, even Shane, like he wasn't, he was never like a pusher. Like he never was like, you have to take him. Like I didn't take Clen then because I, I didn't know. I didn't know that it was like pretty reasonable. Took fucking Nolvidex. Like I, I made decisions. Like it was, it was completely like consent, consensual. Like, but even then, like there was not a push from him to be like, you must take like these, I'm pretty sure I was on two and a half of Anavar. Like, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't much. Um, it's not to say that's everyone's experience. It's just to say that like the context around these drugs and the context around why people make decisions around what to take, um, it's multifaceted. And I, I feel confident in saying a lot of the time, a lot of the times these decisions, um, athletes aren't advocating what they really want. They, they might be focusing or, or maybe they're focusing exclusively on the, the performance and like how they place on stage. And that to me is like, it's scary. It's scary because even if we put the drug in place, even if it does make a difference, you still might not win. And like, if the likelihood of you winning is already uncertain, which it always is, look at these pros. Like, I mean, like you fucking see these girls competing, like so many shows back to back and like. Ashley's a great example that like, I mean, she does objectively so well on stage, but there are shows she doesn't win at. I mean, she takes it on the chin. She's like, yep. And on to the next one. This is why I do the sport because I'm, I like competing and like the placing itself does not keep me in the sport. She's hella competitive, like both as, as an athlete, but then also I think my perception is, um, her mindset around competing is very competitive, but <laughs> I think when you go in with this like qualifier of like, okay, I'm going to take a higher risk if it reduces that certainty of not winning. Sure. Sure. But if all of your actions, all of your behaviors are under that principle, under that, like, okay, here's the condition. It'll reduce, or, or I guess, increase my chance of winning. 
yeah, but at a certain point, that's just not true. Like there, there's a ceiling for which it actually does. And I guess like my, I don't want to say my issue. Cause it's like, because frankly, I don't give a fuck. It's not my, it's not my business. It's not my business. What other people take, it's not my business, how they take it. What I'm responsible for are the people like who, who I work with, who I advise to on. And then obviously like my, my own use, like that's what I'm responsible for. And if I have a say in it, I'm going to lean towards the likelihood of it not making a difference unless, unless there's like very good evidence to suggest otherwise, which sometimes there has been, but most of the time there's not most of the time, the gap that we're trying to close from an athlete, maybe you, the listener, maybe the gap we're trying to close, like, fuck, there was a girl, there's a girl last year who like, I did a, I did a consult with, no, I did a coaching call with, and she was telling me how her coach like continued to increase her Anavar up and up until she was at 20 milligrams. And I'm like, for a national show, like it didn't work at 10, 10 didn't close the gap for you. And then like, you did one national show at five, you went up to 10 for the next one, 15, 20. And I'm like, oh, like, where's the, where's the cutoff? And like, I mean, besides the point, like I followed her career and I'm like, you weren't even conditioned. Like, sorry, but your conditioning was not there with her. I like specifically was like, man, that's such a shame because like you continue with that justification and maybe, maybe there is a rationale, but you continue with rationalizing every decision. And now this isn't decision-making. This isn't like, this isn't logical. This begins to look more and more like an emotional decision. And maybe to what cost? I mean, maybe whatever you, you turn pro and like, you didn't realize you're like, cool, got away with it. But I don't like setting that as an example. I think that's a really poor example to set for everyone. I think that's, I think that kind of behavior, I think if I see like when I started making these videos, when I started like 23, yeah, 2023, like I think literally the first video is like early January when I started making these videos it was very heavy on like, this is what the drug does. Pfft, nothing else about like app, like very little about application and how I would use this. Like I was very, I was very hesitant with talking about application and like giving my own opinion because frankly, I didn't feel like, didn't feel like anyone cared. Still don't feel like anyone cares. I just don't listen. Don't listen. Don't listen to me. I'm a girl on Instagram. Just literally fucking talking about drugs. Like it's don't get your medical advice from Instagram or YouTube or Spotify or Apple podcast. Take what I'm saying as an anecdote, take it as, um, take it with a grain of salt or don't take it at all. That's fine. Um, but there are a lot of people in the sport who, whether they admit it or not, like I would reckon that they have regrets about use. And I would even go as far to say if they had been better educated and informed prior to use, they may have made different decisions. And that to me is enough to continue talking about this stuff. At least giving you some food for thought, a grain of salt, if you will. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. I hope this was helpful. Uh, as always, like, comment, subscribe. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you in the next one.